first of all, I will give some definitions so that we have a common uh, terminology and therefore we understand each other without any misunderstanding. And in the second section, I will uh, dwell on Turkey and even beyond Turkey. Uh, as to the definitions, I will define these two concepts. Uh, identity, of course, from the viewpoint of states, and the concept of state, of course, from the viewpoint of, uh, view, viewpoint of identity. Now, identity can be divided into two for our pur special purposes here tonight. Infra-identity and supra-identity. Infra-identity uh, is the ethno-religious affiliation of the group to which the individual feels to belong. And supra-identity is the identity imposed by the state on its citizens in order to create cohesion. If we come to the state and define it from the viewpoint of identities, there are, again, two sorts of states. One, empires, and two, nation states. Uh, from this very special viewpoint, empire is, the, is a type of state that does not meddle with the identities of its subjects. Of course, infra-identities of its subjects. In contradistinction with this, a nation state is a type of state that fully interferes with the infra-identities of its citizens. Uh, one remark, quite important, Na the concept of nation state is not to be confused with the concept of national state. A na nation state is a type of state that represses by assimilation or by ethno-religious cleansing, the infra-identities of its citizens, while a national state is nothing like this. National state is associated with the date 1789, that is to say, the French Revolution, and declares that sovereignty belongs to the people. While a nation state is associated with the last quarter of the 19th century when imperialism started, declares that sovereignty belongs to the dominant ethno-religious group in the nation. So uh, no comparison. Now, now that we have these definitions, terminology, uh, let us look into Turkey. Turkey, of course, is the continuation of the Ottoman Empire in many ways. Uh, Ottoman Empire was said to have 72 and a half nations, so is Turkey, but we say no more and a half because it's now, we understand that it's now a, a hate speech, because that half is the Chingene. Therefore, we say that Turkey has 72 nations. Uh, the name and the uh, upper identity of the empire was Ottoman. 
that upper identity made no reference whatsoever to any ethnic or religious identity, inner identity. When the Ottoman Empire revolved into Turkish Republic in 1923, no, before 1923, during the War of Independence, 1919-1922, the young Turks, who later came to be called Kemalists, <laughs> continued with the main spirit of the empire. That, that is to say, their uh, upper identity was a territorial name, Türkiye'li, of Turkey, one who belongs to Turkey, one who is from Turkey. Uh, that uh, upper identity was prevalent since 1915 in Britain. Uh, but after independence, uh, the uh, fathers of the new Turkey replaced Türkiye'li with Türk, which is the name, at the same time, the name of a definite and dominant ethno-religious group of the nation. Uh, to uh, see how it was replaced, how it uh, was transformed from Turkey to Turk, uh, we just uh, look into the constitutions of Turkey. We have had so far four of them. In the first constitution, 1921, uh, Turk was mentioned zero times. In 1924, it was mentioned 12 times. In the third constitution, 1961, it was mentioned 24 times, and the actual uh, uh, constitution, it was mentioned 70 times. Great mistake from the uh, point of view of Turks. Great mistake because replacing it replacing a territorial upper identity with an ethno-religious upper identity was a, the sign of a degrading assimilation uh, that alienated the Kurds, the second most important identity in Turkey. Great mistake again, because the Turks were dominant anyway culturally and economically. Great mistake because Kemalists, the founders of the nation, not only started with it, but insisted on it all the way to, to, to the day. Uh, many people in Turkey, many intellectuals, leftists, leftists is, uh, the uh, subject of another talk that could take up to two hours at least, uh, always said that Democratic Party, who came, which came to power in 1950, was a counter-revolution. Kemalist revolution was a revolution, and 1950 was a counter-revolution. I am of a diverse opinion. I think that, and quite a few people now, think that the Democratic Party power was a tremendous opportunity for Turkey to come down to the room temperature from a revolutionary fervor that could not go on. Do you remember that? Uh, Newsweek or uh, Time magazine, I don't recall right now, said something very important for the Beatles. It said, they are too hot not to cool off. Of course, Kemalist revolution in 1930s was too hot not to cool off, but it did not cool off. It was not able to profit from Democratic Party power 
that would bring him down to a normal uh, degree, as I said. Uh, what happened? Well, uh, there we need another definition. Uh, the question is, uh, what does a semi-feudal or feudal state do to modernize, to become democratic and everything? Wait or make a revolution from above? Of course, a revolution from above is very understandable for such a country. But the Kemalists did not realize that, could not at the time, I, I guess, that a revolution from above was a one-shot gun that would explode and want the person who held the trigger if it was fired more than one time. It was fired uh, more than four times. 19, uh, the, the, the 27 May 1960 military coup, 12 March 1971 military coup, uh, 12 uh, September 1980 military coup and 1997 postmodern coup or whatever. Uh, and in all during all these uh, uh, multiplied revolutions from above. All the mountains in the east were spread with uh, gigantic writings on the mountains uh, that uh, the, 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 about the supremacy of the Turk. It was a great mistake uh, because the, uh, the Kemalists, the founders, had an unbelievably great advantage at the beginning the remnants of the millet system. Uh, you, I, I'm sure you understood right away, because Turks and the Kurds were Sunni Muslims. And almost everywhere in the world, but especially in the Balkans and the Middle East, especially in the Middle East, religious identity and more precisely, uh, confessional identity is the only, let's say, is the most important element of national identity, if not the uh, only element. Uh, but uh, in these, uh, despite these, all these things, uh, Türk replaced Türkiye. And again, I will go on saying that it was a great mistake. Of course, the, it's easy to find mistakes with a retrospective look. At that time, it was not that easy. And especially if you had such a strong ideology as nationalism, which, which was which reflected to the cover of the book. Uh, uh, during all my readings all these years, I came to realize that there is a chronology uh, concerning the state and the ideology, uh, identity, I mean. Chronology of two competing concepts. I came to understand that assimilation, if assimilation starts before 
the minority consciousness, it has a lot of chances to succeed. But in contradistinction with this, if the minority consciousness starts before uh, assimilation, assimilation has no chances so ever it only serves to strengthen the minority consciousness. Now, to apply this, uh, these concepts and definitions to Turkey, uh, of course, assimilation is identical with uh, what uh, we might call uh, national economic market, because national economic market makes everything uh, resemble to each other. In Turkey, national economic mar market started with President Özal uh, in mid-80s, 1980s, while the Kurdish consciousness started at the beginning of the 1960s with the 1961 constitution, if not before, if not in 1925. But I will take 1960s and assimilation st uh, and uh, national economic market started in 1980s. Too late to stop and kill the Kurdish consciousness. Uh, as a Conclusion, I would say, today, the young Kurds who are the unwanted child of the young Turks say no more, we are Türkiye'li. I'm not saying this. The, Kurd, the Kurds who are from my generation say this with regret, they say, we used to say, we are from Turkey, Turkeyanese. The youngsters say no more of that. And on top of that, of course, with the AKP power, reckless power, uh, the identity of Turkey is mixed with uh, let me put it this way. The ideology of the Kemalists could be, can be called Türk Islam Sentesi. I don't need to uh, translate this, do I? The ideology of AKP is Islam Türk Sentesi. Uh, we could, if you have questions about that, I can open this. But let me go beyond Turkey. The English did not make these mistakes, the several mistakes I told, I told you about. They never called the state England and the citizen English. Every time they expanded, and they expanded their theory a lot, as we know, Every time they expanded their territory, they rebaptized their state to show that they cared about uh, the people of the country they annexed. Let's see. Kingdom of England, <clears throat> Kingdom of Great Britain in 1707. United Kingdom of Great Britain and Ireland in 1801. And on top of that, every time they change their flag, and mind you, the flag was called Union Jack. Therefore, uh, because they did not make these mistakes that the Turks made, the whole thing evolved around the nucleus of the English, more or less. 
Uh, and that's why they were rewarded at the last Scottish referendum. And that's why other nations called this great country Inglaterra, Angleterre, Anglia, Engaltera, Inglaterra. Thank you.